This is the age of the countdown, of rockets galore, rockets as tall as church steeples, and handy sized models only a few feet long, and with mid 20th century names that couldn't really belong to anything else. Blue Streak and Minuteman, Titan and Sea Cat, Thunderbird and Honest John. Rockets for defense and for saving life. Here, being tested, is the latest ejector seat, rocket assisted to shoot a pilot well clear of his plane, even at ground level. Up he goes to some 400 feet, high enough to ensure him a safe parachute descent. Behind the spectacular performance of modern rockets is a highly specialized backroom world. A world of top secrets, official passes and security checks. A world where you've got to watch your step in the presence of the sensitive, high-powered fuels that drive rockets to speeds of thousands of miles an hour. In these laboratories of Britain's Ministry of Aviation, the search goes on for even better fuels that will send rockets further, faster and higher. And even when you're handling tiny quantities, you've got to keep your distance. Out of hundreds of types of fuel tested, only a few are rated good enough to be put into production. Here, a strand of a new solid fuel is checked for its rate of burning in a timing cabinet known as a window bomb. These doors are solid lead, a barrier against the X-rays used to detect any flaws in construction. If they were not discovered, they could easily cause the rocket to blow up. Among rocket scientists, fuel is a burning topic. Solid fuels still don't give a rocket the control in flight or the thrust per pound of fuel that liquids do. But liquids, like the oxygen here, are trickier to handle and aren't easy to store. From the chemist laboratories, new fuels are sent to this engine testing center at Westcott for trying out in rockets. Up go the warning flags, red to show the rockets arrived, yellow an imminent firing. In this testing shed in the heart of the countryside of southern England, the rocket is got ready for blast off. Everything's checked and double checked to ensure that this one doesn't go anywhere. It's safely tethered, permanently grounded, and they haven't lost one yet. This is how you can shoot your rocket and keep it. Keep it for the backroom boys to examine both during and after the test run. To fly your rocket, you take it to the range at Aberporth in South Wales, where the security net's drawn tight. It's just as well this driver's got his pass, because he's bringing what the boys call the hardware. In this quiet corner of Cardigan Bay, they've got used to rockets to sharing the wide open spaces, the sea and the sky with Britain's missiles. Sometimes you can forget all about them in this pastoral setting, but not for long. For it's here the rocket men come from all over Britain to hit the bullseye, or so they hope, with their latest prototypes. Their rocket may have taken years to develop and millions of pounds too. In the 12 years since Britain went into the guided weapons race, we've spent hundreds of millions on rocket research and development. Today, rocketry is a science in itself, with its own chemists, designers and engineers. This is a realm of experiment in which a single error anywhere along the line from the drawing board to that first test flight could prove costly. Even with well-tried rockets like this Bloodhound, often called the most important piece of hardware in Britain's inventory, tests go on to improve its performance. Around 10 years of experiment and tens of millions of pounds have already gone into this 25-foot-tall century of the Cold War, a surface-to-air guided weapon now in service with the Royal Air Force.
Under that nose shield is bloodhound sensitive brain, the electronic wonder that guides it relentlessly onto the target, if necessary, right down to sea level. Once the rocket is set at the correct angle, it's fired automatically as soon as the target comes within its range of some 60 miles and takes a course directed by its target tracking radar. The boffins can learn a lot about a rocket's performance in flight from the high-speed camera, which sees things far beyond the limits of the human eye. Now the station is getting ready for another blast-off. Safety's given top priority, so first, it's down with the barriers on all roads leading to the firing site. The fire crews stand by. And now the man at the centre of the whole operation, the ground controller, checks that the range is clear, that everyone's ready, that all the instruments are set. He's got more than 150 controls there. All set for the firing now. If the rocket goes off course, it'll be destroyed in flight by the safety officer. And here's a naval observer who's just about as close as it's possible to get in safety. In goes the master key. The seconds tick away. Booster rockets fall away as Bloodhound soars over Cardigan Bay at a speed that's still secret. Information sent out by the rocket about its own behaviour in flight is collected by these astonishing receivers. Temperatures, pressures, the efficiency of the motors, facts such as these are poured into these king-sized tape recorders. To find the answer to even one problem often means a succession of firings. The boffins' search for knowledge is endless. They must find out more and more if they're to stay in the rocket race. When something goes wrong, as it did here, they're soon on the spot to discover the cause. For this is a world of ideas, of trial and error a precision industry which measures success in heights and speeds and distances and maneuverability. Out of today's research will come a new generation of even better rockets, for peaceful purposes as well as defence. Meanwhile, every firing is a voyage of discovery. <laughs>